New construction strata communities. Wherever you look, there are construction sites everywhere. Developers can't keep up with the demand for more housing, even though the question of affordability is now also in the forefront, while some of the predictions for future mortgage rates are gloomy. With so many good people in the housing industry working tirelessly to relieve this pressure, one can still be optimistic the housing questions will have positive answers. In this part, we will discuss the following. Most common types of stratas, key life cycles of a strata project, roles of developers, roles of management companies, and warranties. Knowing what type of strata community you're buying into should be an important consideration as some types may not suit your lifestyle. Most common types of strata communities in BC are condominiums and townhomes. Some communities will also have large landscaped areas and multiple amenities, such as a gym, clubhouse, golf course, swimming pool, tennis court, etc. You should ask yourself the question, what is your lifestyle and would you like amenities where you're planning to live? Remember, more amenities translates to higher cost and higher strata fees. Large strata projects or so-called master plan communities can also have added layers that may complicate governance and operations. For example, in mixed-use stratas, there will be different types of strata lots, condos, townhomes, retail stores, offices, affordable housing units, etc. Developers can also decide on what specific legal designations should their mixed-use strata corporations have. The three different types we most commonly are dealing with would be sections, airspace parcel, and types. Sections. In sections, you will have a commercial section, a residential section, and a strata corporation, often referred to as a joint section. As there are competing interests between residential and commercial strata lots, each section will have their own councils, budgets, strata fees, most contracts, and bylaws. What is most important to successfully govern a section strata is to separate the service contracts correctly and have fair cost allocations in place. That way, the owners can minimize friction between the sections. Airspace parcel. In airspace parcel developments, part of the building is not stratified, but operated independently and will share common area costs with the strata corporation. Usually, the residential part of the building forms the strata corporation and is designated as airspace parcel. The commercial component is the non-strata part of the project and is designated as the remainder land. Cost-sharing agreements should be prepared carefully by the developer's lawyers and the cost-sharing schedule should be included in the disclosure statement. Without a detailed cost-sharing schedule with exact percentage split costs, the management company and the future strata council will have a challenging time sorting things out after the fact. Types. Out of the three, a typed setup is perhaps the easiest to manage. In a mixed-use project where you could have condos and townhomes, some building systems and common areas may not be used by one type of strata lot. For example, the townhomes may not use the elevators inside a condo tower and therefore they won't pay towards elevator maintenance. A typed budget will specify which budget line items will pertain to which type of strata lot. Both the condos and the townhomes will still belong to the same strata corporation and any specific cost allocation, use of building systems and common areas should be specified in the bylaws. In all mixed-use stratas, there should be specific bylaws to help manage the certain nuances the council and owners will have to live with. Key life cycles of a strata. When I used to manage new construction stratas and help developers, it was very helpful to know trigger dates and to know who's in charge and who is paying the bills in different time periods. The first time period is during the planning stages, at which time developers should already start working with a management company. 
ultimately, the project will end up on the lap of the management company, and their advice and suggestions should be given serious consideration. Their suggestions will mostly pertain to interim budgets, certain bylaws, overall functionality of common areas, and service contracts. At this stage, the developer is in charge and they pay all the bills. The second time period is when the developer files their plans with the superintendent of real estate. The Strata Property Act also provides clear instructions to developers in the establishment of the Strata Corporation, and I will now highlight three examples. From the time the Strata plan is deposited in the land title office, a Strata Corporation is established, and the owners of the Strata lots in the Strata plan are members of the Strata Corporation under the name, the owners, Strata plan, XYZ. This legal designation, which is usually a combination of letters and numbers, will be the official Strata plan. Subject to any limitation, under this act, a Strata Corporation has the power and capacity of a natural person of full capacity. Responsibilities of the Strata Corporation, except as otherwise provided in this act, the Strata Corporation is responsible for managing and maintaining the common property and common assets of the Strata Corporation for the benefits of the owners. Strata Corporation functions through the Council. The powers and duties of the Strata Corporation must be exercised and performed by a Council unless this Act, the regulations or the bylaws provide otherwise. Keeping all this in mind from the Strata Property Act, at this stage the developer is still in charge and they still pay all the bills. Now down to the third time period, which starts on the first day of the month, following the month in which the first conveyancing took place. The conveyancing date is when you see your lawyer to finalize the sale and to transfer title of ownership from the developer to your name. The first conveyancing happens shortly after the occupancy permit was issued to the developer. If the first conveyancing takes place, let's say on June 22nd, that means the Strata Corporation as a legal entity will come alive on the first day of the following month, on July 1st. At this time, the developer is still in charge and will be the acting Strata Council who must make decisions in the best interest of the Strata Corporation. At this time, all common area expenses will be paid from the interim budget, which was disclosed to all purchasers in the disclosure statement. All owners will now start paying Strata fees, which includes the developer, for any unsold Strata lots. The fourth time period will begin on the first day of the month following the month in which the first annual general meeting took place. If the Strata holds the first AGM on August 23rd, for example, the interim period will run from July 1st to August 31st, and then the static 12 months fiscal year will always be from September 1st to August 31st. At this time, the newly elected council will be in charge and all owners are paying for common area expenses through strata fees. The role of the developer is further defined in the Act and developers must meet their obligations under the Strata Property Act such as owner developers control of Strata Corporation. Under the Strata Property Act, the role of the developer is very clear under the relevant sections of the Strata Property Act, which states the owner developer must exercise the powers and perform the duties of a council from the time the Strata Corporation is established until a council is elected at the Strata Corporation's first annual general meeting. In exercising the powers and performing the duties of a council, the owner developer need not comply with bylaw requirements respecting the constitution of the council or holding or conduct a council meeting. Under the owner developer standard of care, they must also exercise the powers and perform the duties of a council. The owner-developer must act honestly and in good faith 
with a view to the best interest of the Strata Corporation. And again, exercise the care, diligence, and skill of a reasonably prudent person in comparable circumstances. The owner-developer must make reasonable efforts to pursue any remedies under warranties in existence with respect to the construction of the common property and common assets. There are further obligations listed in the Strata Property Act with regards to the developer's duties and obligations. Suffice to say, developers are held to a high standard of care. All developers should strive for excellence to build high-quality homes, to provide quality customer service, which in turn will also help grow their reputation and brand. Many owners ask this question, is the management company working for the developer or my strata? The simple and honest answer is, management companies are working for the strata corporation, period. Yes, it is true that managing agents are engaged early by developers and long before the first owners move in. However, the role of the management company remains the same, and that is to do right by the future Strata Corporation. Management companies will also provide advice and guidance to developers on various items in a similar fashion a lawyer would, but of course within the agent's own expertise and license. Developers may or may not heed the advice of their consultants and the final decisions will rest with them. Oftentimes, owners have a misguided instinct to fire management companies due to deficiencies in their new buildings. Management companies have nothing to do with deficiencies and warranties. It is up to the developer's customer service team to address legitimate warranty claims. The role of the management company is to help the new Strata Council file a warranty claim, and that's it. If warranty claims will become contentious, the Strata should consider hiring a lawyer for best results.